in a world forever held captive by winter's icy grasp. One adventurer will take you on their journey as they forge their path through the snowscape trying to survive long enough to save this world. They have just one life in which to research and automate an array of machinery in the hopes that just one of them can end winter's icy grasp. Remember to subscribe for in the tale that's about to unfold you're not gonna regret it. Our journey starts where all good stories begin, cold and lost in an unfamiliar landscape. Let's begin. The first thing we need to do is break some leaves so we can get some sticks. We're on the clock and need to act fast before our climate clemency wears off. Over the frozen lake, we're reminded of the dangers that lurk in the snow. Shelter is going to be necessary, so let's canvas the area to see what's available. This'll do for now. Let's craft our sticks into improvised planks so we can make a crafting table. The first tool that we need to make is an ice chisel. We can also make up some fire sticks while we're at it, but we can use the chisel to crack up this icy river to make it easier to destroy. In doing so, we're given some icy shards. We'll use these for some early game crafting, so we're going to grab a bunch before retreating inland. It looks like we've stumbled upon a village, which is a very nice find. We can salvage its hay bales and sugar cane, then find a nice big house to set up a home inside of. Welcome to our base of operations. For sure it's a fixer-upper, but it'll do nicely while we get set up on this planet. Let's craft some of our icy shards into sharpened ice. That way we can make some basic tools like a pickaxe. And since we're in a hurry, let's head out and ultimine one of these abandoned houses for its cobblestone. Sorry villagers, it's for the greater good? Probably? Using that cobble we can upgrade instantly to a stone pickaxe but more importantly we can craft up a stone axe. Now we have a way to fell trees, which after a few chops will net us some logs and possibly apples and saplings too. On the way back we can grab the blast furnace as that's going to be a huge help later on. Once home we can store everything we found in a chest so we can more easily organise things later. And let's tidy up our new home just a little bit as it's a tad cold on the feet. Now let's get our progression hat on and craft up a campfire. If we cook up some cobblestone, we're able to make some regular stone, but there's something incredibly important that we've forgotten to do. Let's craft up some wooden shears, head out into the world and get some leaves. Our first fight, we are very underprepared. Let's hope our axe can do this. Okay, that sucked. It did kill the iron golem, let's see. Oh my goodness, four iron ingots. That is a huge advancement right there. Back home, we can turn the leaves into vines and the vines into leafy string. And the remainder of the leaves can be turned into leafy armor. This will help protect us from the cold once our clemency ends. However, we're going to keep the leather boots on as that's going to help us survive the powdered snow. And there's a lot of it out there. With the side project finally done, let's turn our stone and snowballs into calcite, which we can cook into bone meal. We'll turn some of that into white dye, then craft it all together to make some floral fertilizer. Now we need to steal some dirt from outside, and it's time to upcycle our house into something a little more productive. Third floor installed, we can use our fertilizer to get ourselves some botania flowers. We can then craft up some petals to make a petal apothecary. Now, since the water on this planet is a little bit frozen solid, we're going to need to make up some bowls, craft them together with some ice shards to make some bowls of ice, which then can be cooked into lovely bowls of water. We can use these to fill up our apothecary. Now we need to duplicate our white and light blue petals using bone meal, as we're going to need a lot of them. One, two, three white petals and four light blue. Chuck in some seeds and we have a glacy flora. We can also throw in four white petals to get ourselves a pure daisy. Let's make a pasture seed too while we're at it so we can turn this dirt into grass. And finally while we're at it, we have a ton of flowers. A flower pouch will for sure be needed to keep them organised. With our pure daisy, we can place down some logs and very slowly they'll get infused into living wood. And with stone, they will very slowly infuse into living rock. We're going to be doing this a lot. Now we need a wand of the forest, a mana pool and a mana spreader. If we make a tactical hole in our ceiling, we can pop down our glacier flora in the snowfall. Then our mana pool with our mana spreader hooked into it and that's going to generate mana from the snow and turn it into usable mana in our pool. The last thing to complete in this chapter is to use some shears on some grass and that's chapter complete. Our next task is going to be working on ore generation and processing which, well... We're going to need a lot more space and a lot more mana. So let's get that done and we can move on to the next chapter.
So we've got some crops growing, as food security seems quite important. If we head outside, we can see that we've now got a compound wall surrounding our house. This gives us an added layer of protection against hostiles, and it allows us to work outside a little bit. We also have a lot more glacier flora, but for sure we are going to need even more, as they are very, very slow. Back inside, we've got a shop, and if we add in our quest currency, we can buy a mega torch. This will ward off any of the local hostiles, so we're a little bit safer again. But let's add some water to our apothecary. Throw in some charcoal and an assortment of petals, toss in a seed, and we now have an orchid. We can pop this down next to our mana pool, and if we place a coarse dirt next to it, it'll get transformed into clay. And if we cook that clay on a campfire, we'll get some bricks, which we can then turn into our very first furnace. Now let's combine our granite with some sharpened ice and we'll get some frozen granite. This can be transformed into actually useful resources. We can place it next to our orchid and it'll get transformed. We can do the same with diorite and now we have access to iron ore. Sadly, it looks like we need an iron pickaxe to mine iron, so for now we'll just smelt it at a 1 to 1 ratio. Then we can upgrade to an iron pickaxe, but we're probably going to need a fortune enchant to get better results. Since we have clay, we can combine some plant pots with terracotta to make some botany pots, which when combined with hoppers gives us an automated version. So we can remove this indoor wheat and replace it with an automated and much faster wheat farm. We can do the same again with a sapling for a wood supply. But now we must dig to the core of the planet and try and find a source of lava. With lava acquired, we can now craft a level 2 resource generator. Two of them in fact. We gonna need a lot of these going forward. Let's craft up some storage drawers, pop it down somewhere, generator on top and the diorite on top of that. Now we have very slow but automated diorite. We can take it one step further and if we place in a frozen diorite at the top instead, we now generate frozen diorite, ready to be converted by our orchid. Now we just need to duplicate this setup a few times for all of the frozen ores and let them generate and convert. We may as well expand the compound once again while we wait. It took some time, but we're now ready to continue with chapter 2, feeling a lot safer than before. We have a much more substantial compound wall, with a roof covering our immediate area to keep the snow away. Our glacier flora now have their own dedicated section in the snow, and here we are generating almost everything we can with generators. The redstone blocks are the best way that we can speed them up at the moment. So it's time to start thinking about automating the orchid. Using a block breaker and a block placer, we can very quickly place and break blocks. Our problem lies within picking up the broken items. Every option requires an ender pill, which is why we're going to be carrying a boat on us for quite a while. But if we pump in some snow blocks into the block placer, we can see just how quickly blocks get broken. And it turns out breaking snow blocks is an early source of gold nuggets. So if we can automate this somehow, easy gold. But before we continue, there's something very cheesy that we need to do. So we've got 21 quest currency. If we go to the shop and buy 7 basic loot boxes, we can open these up and we have gained 2 currency and a bunch of items like Fortune 3 and Silk Touch. We also got 13 advanced loot boxes. If we open these up, we get even more items like obsidian and super expensive item repairers. And we're up to 11 currency returned. Let's take these and buy three more loot boxes. Opened up, we get 11 currency returned and 16 advanced loot boxes, which gives us a total of 13 currency returned. Four more boxes brings us up to 15 currency returned. And then finally, five more boxes leaves us with 35 currency returned. It's incredible. We just got an absolute ton of items for free and left with more currency than we spent. One more cycle through for luck and we've ended up with a profit of 56 currency. Kind of addicting for sure. So let's grab some frozen andesite. We'll add one to the blacklist of the block breaker and the rest can go in the block placer. Very quickly, we'll start generating usable frozen ores, providing we've got enough mana, which I don't think is going to last very long. And that is chapter two complete, but not automated yet. For that, we're going to need ender pearls. For chapter three, we'll be digging into some power and using machines to process our ores and make alloys. So let's start with making a sterling dynamo, which will consume furnace fuel in order to make power. Up next is some RF machine frames, which we can drop into our mana pool to convert them into thermal machine frames, one of which we can use to make a pulverizer. If we throw in some iron ore and some flint, we have a small chance to get a better ratio and it can double its output. Like now, we turn one iron into two iron dust. If we combine two lots of iron dust and a nickel dust, we get Invar Blend, our first alloy. 
once smelted, we can make some Envar gears, and then all we're missing is some glass. We'll get the sand from pulverizing gravel, which we can get by pulverizing cobblestone. We can now craft up a magma crucible, we're going to be needing this shortly. And doing the same again, we can make a blast chiller. The final thing to craft is a storage scanner, which we can just place down here for now, as we're going to need to tinker about with this to try and work out how this thing functions. So with chapter 3 complete, once again it's time to organise and tinker. After some tinkering, we now have a way to kind of but not amazingly automate the orchid. We'll still need an ender pill, so sadly, we can't turn this on just yet. We'll also need a way to replenish the pickaxes once they break. We also now have automated storage. Crafting has been made a hundred times easier just by being able to access all of our chests at once. We've also got this horn of the covering which we can use to just instantly clear away snow. A discovery has also been made. This ball shows us our current temperature. If we hold the lava bucket, we heat up. Duh. If we hold the powdered snow bucket, we start to freeze. Of course. But knowing where we're going next, we are for sure going to need the freezing effect when we're heading through to the nether. Which is no doubt going to be hot. We can also use iron armor to cool us down. So let's light the portal and step inside. Ooh. That's a long way down. We are here because we need netherrack. We can also risk it all and try to climb down lower so we can grab some magma blocks. Then head back through the portal to our main dimension. Let's pop some netherrack into the magma crucible to get some molten netherrack. Then once we've got a bucket worth, we can send it over to the blast chiller with an ice shard and we'll get frozen netherrack. A new resource that we can generate infinite amounts of with the resource generator. Sadly, this frozen netherrack is useless to us right now, as we need a different kind of orchid. Instead, we're going to need an Orchid Ignum. First though, we're going to make up an Induction Smelter. We don't need it just yet, but it'll make future alloys much easier to make. But now we need to turn our attention to the Orchid Ignum. It's a lot of microcrafting. It turns out the only place that we can use this Orchid Ignum is in the Nether, which is insane, because now we need a brand new way to generate mana. Ain't no snow in the Nether, sadly. Until then, we can get ourselves a mana tablet to transfer the mana here manually. To make one, we need an Ender Pearl. It's time to hunt for Enderman. The map shows Enderman to the west, so let's bridge across this gap and find them. We made it! Let's unequip our powdered snow and pop down a boat. Please get into the boat. Yes! We've got an ender pill and another enderman takes their place in the boat. Ew! Why does the floor sound so wet? Well, we have some more volunteers and another pearl. We'll hang around here for a little bit and then head back to the main dimension. We made it home with six ender pearls. Let's convert three into mana pearls and craft up a mana tablet. We can toss this into our full mana pool and drain half of it into the tablet for transporting. Then with a new mana pool and a full tablet, let's head back to our Orchid Ignum, pop down the mana pool, toss in the tablet and drain the mana. And we can place down some frozen netherrack to convert it over to new ores. Oh dear, that didn't convert many at all. We are going to need an insane amount of mana generation to keep up with this. We got one frozen diamond ore and two frozen ancient debris. Not ideal. And since we have just a few Fortune 3 books from the shop cheese, it's going to be fully worth it to pop it onto our iron pickaxe, so we have a chance of getting more than one diamond from our diamond ore. But with that done, that is chapter 4 now complete, but not even close to being automated. We have been flying through the chapters, but I think that's about to change dramatically. Next, we're likely going to have to harness the four elements with elemental craft, but since we've completed yet another chapter, it's time to reorganise and look into automating our overworld orchid. That was a lot of tinkering, but we now have a way to automate the orchid. Originally, we planned on using pipes, but in order to filter out the pickaxe to be repaired, we would need a diamond filter. Ouch. So instead, we'll be using lasers. In the side facing our item repairer, we have an item card inserting the pickaxe. We also have an extract card pulling the repaired pickaxe down into our block breaker. In the side facing the breaker, we've got the insert card, but more importantly, our extract card has got a basic filter in it. We only want to pull out the pickaxe once it has been used. So we are blacklisting the repaired pickaxe with matching NBT data, and this seems to work well for us. Though we're not currently running this system because we have no way 
way of processing the ores that are picked up by the Vacumulator. But we've got this pipe that runs underground over towards some blast furnaces. One furnace for each of the frozen ores. Currently they're not running as we've got no fuel to give them. Instead, we can use the magic of Batania to fuel them indefinitely. That's why outside this door we've got a new set of Glacy Floras, whose main goal is to generate enough mana to power our furnaces. But before we dive into that, we now have a gold generator using snow blocks and lasers. Sounds exciting, but it's not infinite, as we're not guaranteed 4 snowballs each time, but it lasts a while and it is so easy to get more snow. In exciting news, we caught ourselves a chicken. We're going to be needing feathers very soon, so this is a massive win. So back to automating our refueling, we need to make an exoflame, which means we're going to need a runic altar. Thankfully, working out the orchid automation took quite a long time, so we've had plenty of spare mana to generate diamonds, enough to make diamond tools. Let's convert some diamonds into mana diamonds and craft up a runic altar. We can pop it next to one of our mana pools and we can point a mana spreader into it. The first and easiest rune that we're going to make is the rune of earth. So redstone dust into mana powder, iron ingot into mana steel, add them to the altar with some stone, a coal block and a mushroom, and it'll start to make the rune. Then we chuck on a living rock and we now have two runes of earth. Next we need the rune of air, but we're still waiting on a feather. We need the rune of fire, but that's going to need nether wart, and the rune of summer needs a slime ball, so we're going to tackle that bit next. So let's craft up a multi-servo press, which we can use to make two constantum plates and two invar plates, which will let us craft the unpacking die. Then if we pop that into the press with a magma block, we'll get four magma cream, which when crafted with a water bucket gets us our slime. Now we must get our nether wart. On the way, let's do some piglin trading, as that way we have a chance of getting some arrows for our bow. Again, we don't have any feathers. Not too long later, we have 12 arrows and a bunch of other junk. Let's find a fortress. It turns out a bastion works too, but it's much scarier. A singular wart right in the center. Of course, we can edge our way down very slowly, making sure to make no path for a brute to get to us. It's being guarded by a brute. So let's use our bow and clear this fella out. Two fellas. Hopefully we've got enough arrows. We did. Right. Let's jump down and tower up back quickly. Oh, the anxiety. On the way out, we can grab the glowstone and then retreat back home where it's a tiny bit safer. So now we can make the rune of fire. Now to just work out the rest. It finally happened. We got a second chicken from the egg so we could breed them and get a feather. We now have the exo flame so hopefully we can now power our furnaces for free. Let's pop it in the center and yes it absolutely does work. Providing we're generating enough mana that is. So now we can take our resource generator mark 2s and fully power up our resource generating orchid. Frozen blocks generate, get placed down, converted, broken and picked up to be sent over to our smelters. For chapter 5, we need to do some elemental craft, but getting ingredients like blaze powder will be very risky. Instead, there's no reason why we can't make a start on chapter 6 and use these HNN machines to generate mob drops from data models. So we'll start by making a model framework, a deep learner and a simulation chamber which we can plug into some power. Then finally we'll need to make some prediction matrix and we're ready to begin. We need to make a data model to generate some generalized overworld predictions and the easiest one for us is for sure going to be snow golems. So let's make a snowy boy, use our model framework on him, hop it into the deep learner and get to work. We need to kill six of these, but once we have, we can start to generate predictions. Like so. These are so powerful because we can now craft a ton of items with it. But even better, we can craft four of them into nether prediction, which gives us access to nether mob drops, like blaze rods. So with another chapter complete, it's time for a tinker and an organize. With tinkering complete, we may now have a way to generate mana in the nether. Well, an idea of how to do it. Over here, we have a self-refueling lava generator, which produces excess lava that we can use for other things. Like putting a bucket of lava into a dispenser, with a hovering hourglass set to 6 minutes, we can feed one thermolily. This will consume the lava source and generate some mana for 1 minute, then it needs 5 minutes to cool down. The problem is, the mana generated is not that high, so we would need dozens of this setup for it to work efficiently. 55 of these in fact, to fill up a mana pool every 6 minutes. Not ideal. However, 
Since we can modify this lava setup to generate even more power, we can likely use something like the Energizera, which is what we've got set up right here. Using a dynamo and a redstone flux cell, we can send power to the flower to generate mana. And this is very easy to scale up, just expensive as each flower requires two diamonds among many other things. Before that, we need to quickly improve our furnace setup so it's going to produce ingots instead of raw ores. A slight oversight, but we can just achieve this by adding another furnace to each ore. So that means there is much tinkering that needs to be done. Our goal is to supply this orchid ignin with enough mana to convert our frozen netherrack to useful ores. The orchid will be supplied mana via a mana pool, which will be filled with a mana spreader which gets its mana from our Energizera. The Energizera will be fed by a redstone flux cell, which will be powered up by three magmatic dynamos. To start with, as for sure we're going to need more flowers. The dynamos will be fed lava from a fluid cell buffer, on top of which we need to place down a fourth magmatic dynamo a few blocks higher. Diagonal for this, we'll place down a magma crucible. This will supply lava to generate initial power and excess lava. To the right of that, we're going to need a redstone furnace and a storage drawer. This is where our generated netherrack will go to make our nether bricks, which is what's going to make our lava. An important step will be adding a diamond filter to our crucible, setting the distribution to nearest first. That means our generation system gets lava before our mana generators. The last steps are to hook up some power pipes and make a netherrack generator. All we need to do now is place down our remaining flowers and we have automated mana generation in the nether. An incredible achievement. We just need to make more flowers to make it faster. So with mana steel armor keeping us nice and cool, we just need to duplicate our block placing system from the overworld. Something like this will do us nicely. Lovely decoration and a slightly scaled up mana production. We're now using tier 2 augments in our machines and using signalum blocks as our speed boosting blocks. But we still need to scale this up higher. It's still incredibly slow. Though we do have 51 frozen diamond ore, so that's wonderful I guess. Another massive upgrade for us is that we now have an enderman data model. So we have access to unlimited ender pearls and ender predictions. We'll need that for the end of elemental craft. So with some space cleared out and a glass slab roof installed, it's time to dive into the elements. We didn't need to go to this extreme of lengths, but it's nice when things look pretty. We'll start by making a bunch of contained crystals. Using some of those, we can make a bunch of element pipes. Next, we're going to need to craft a few small element containers and an element evaporator. So let's pop down a container with the evaporator on top and we can craft up four water crystals and smash them open on the ground to get water shards. These shards can then get slowly evaporated into water essence. Next, we're going to need an element infuser, so we can turn iron ingots into drenched iron ingots, the bane of our future existence. We can run the water essence into a new container with the infuser on top, we can place in an iron ingot and after some time, we'll receive the drenched iron ingot. Moving forward, I think we need to find a way to automate this process, as it's going to be very tedious. And after a quick test, it looks like we can use pipes to do it, and hopefully lasers too. Next, if we place a water shard above water essence, we'll get an amethyst shard. We'll need these later, but it's good to know how it's done. Our next task is to tackle the three other elements. We'll need blaze powder and drenched iron ingots for the fire crystals. Earth crystals require more drenched ingots. Ouch. And air crystals, once again, require drenched iron ingots. And a bunch of glass. Mega ouch. It is time to go on a voyage. We need emeralds, so we're off to the next village to hopefully find some locals. We can just sell them some of our wheat. But after an incredible amount of effort and tinkering, we have very basic automation of each of the elements using pipes and lasers. Each of the four elements have three element evaporators, as they're very slow. They then drain into a main element container where we've got our infuser. And using lasers, we have a way to automate each of the required items like drenched iron. If we put iron ingots into our water system, it'll get lasered onto the infuser and sent back to the barrel as drenched. At the side of the barrels, we've got a large element container. This is for the big crafts coming up using this element binder. A quick sidestep, the reason that we needed those emeralds is because we now have wireless access to our storage using this tablet. It's a small change that's going to make a massive difference to our lives. So at our air binder, we can place in a gold, a drenched, a copper, redstone and an air crystal. It'll slowly consume air essence and create a swift alloy ingot. For sure we're going to want to automate this one too. We need some swift alloy nuggets plus some spring line shards in order to progress and make a strongly contained crystal. The spring line shards are made with amethyst shards, quartz and a water crystal above some water essence. Another one we're going to want to automate. 
which thankfully we can do with lasers. We just need to use counting filters instead of basic filters. Now we need to tackle making each element's gemstone using the gem crystallizer. Oh my goodness are we going to need a lot of essence. Fire is going to be the one that is the hardest as two crystals require four blaze powder. We're getting one blaze rod from two nether prediction which is going to cost us eight overwheel prediction to make. Instead, we need to find a nether mob that will generate the nether prediction directly. Let's make everyone angry and choose piglins. If we pull her up, we can just use our bow to pick them off nice and easy. And hopefully now we can make fire essence for a little bit cheaper. So if we put a diamond into the crystallizer, along with a fire crystal, we have a chance of making a gem. This time we got a crude one, so that goes in with another fire crystal, and this time we got a fine fire gem. We need to do this for each of the elements, and we're going to aim to make two of each gem. With our fire gem, we can bind it with other items to make a fire pedestal. Of course it's the same with the other elements, lots of repeating content. Then finally we'll need a pure infuser. If we place this down, it'll show us the location of where we need to put the element pedestals. So let's make a fire pedestal. We can add in one infuser and our fire gem, one swift alloy ingot and two white rock. And after quite some time, it binds into a pedestal. So let's pop this down and now we just need to grind out the rest. Oh dear. After days of chipping away at this, we now have each of the pedestals, all of which are piped up to a large supply of their corresponding essence. We are trying to make a pure crystal. They require a high amount of essence and a crystal of each flavor. Let's add in our crystals first and finish it off with a diamond. Then we wait and then cry if it doesn't work. Success! That is a very well deserved quest complete notification. Oh my gosh, that was expensive. Almost a full large tank of essence to make one crystal. But now we need to refill the fire essence once again so we can make a fire right ingot. So let's throw in a netherite ingot, a swift alloy ingot, a spring align shard, and our expensive pure crystal. But yes, we finally have a fire right ingot. That takes us on to the final chapter. We need to make a creative element container for each of the elements, all requiring a pristine gem. Thankfully we already have some gems, so we can instantly make the creative water and air container. We just need to upgrade our fire and earth gems to pristine. That's the creative fire container done, which is incredible, and the earth container done. Sadly, the water container messed up when it was accidentally placed next to the earth evaporator, so we're going to need to make an extra water container. But with all the creative containers made, we can move on to next needing to make a fireite block. Thankfully, much easier now we have unlimited essence. Then the very last thing we need to save this planet is going to be a weather changer. Thankfully, with the creative elements, the grind was actually tolerable this time. But there's a problem, as always. The quest book has it ticked by mistake, but we need a blaze prediction. I believe it got ticked when we got our first golem prediction. Not quite the same thing. Either way, the only way to get this blaze prediction is from a blaze data model. We need another fortress. And don't forget, we only have one life. If we die, we don't get a redo. This planet will not be saved. What's exciting is that we can access our storage whilst in the nether thanks to chunk loading. There doesn't seem to be a fortress on the map, so we're going to head south to avoid the basalt deltas. Oh, this is a precarious situation. One slip and it's over. We can splash the fire resistance we got from the piglins just in case. But after some tunneling under hostiles, we have reached the fortress. We can use this simple trick to protect ourselves from the wither skeletons. And we can test to see if it still works. And it does! We found a blaze spawner. Let's quickly make it safe using a similar trick. And if a blaze comes close enough, we can, yes, train a data model. Since this is easy, we may as well kill 12 more to get the next tier of model. Now we just need to find our way home. Home, sweet home. With the blaze prediction in hand, we can craft the weather changer. We have done it! Let's pop this down and the world should start to defrost. Well, it would. If there wasn't a really small tiny detail that we had forgotten. We need a weather catalyst. It kind of requires four Gaia Steel ingots, which only requires us to complete all of Batania a few times. Which means defeating the demigod known as the Guardian of the Gaia. We were so... Close to being done. Now we're going to die. When you're stressed, 
just build things. Our element pit is now nice and tidy at least. We're also now using igneous extruders to generate basic resources quicker than using mana and the orchid. But now that the anxiety is settled, we have a plan for defeating multiple Gaia. We need Gaia steel ingots, which requires a Gaia agglomeration plate. That requires Gaia spirit ingots, but before that we need the terrestrial agglomeration plate. And for that, we need to set up elven trading. We're also going to need some trinkets, like this greater band of mana and aura. We also need to get into botanical brewing to make some flasks that'll give us some buffs. We can also use it to make a necklace that we can infuse a potion into to give us that effect for a mana cost. Then finally we can make some incense sticks that are like very strong beacon effects for a very long duration. That means going forward we're going to need an incredible amount of mana in the overworld. So we're going to massively scale up our nether system here as it works very well. We'll be using 32 floating energizer. We'd better get our Batania grind on and see what we can come up with. Scaled up, this mana system works incredibly well, which is important because Terra Steel ingots are incredibly expensive, requiring half a mana pool of mana each. But we've got the band of mana, we just need Terra Steel to make it a greater band, and we have the greater band of aura which passively generates mana and stores it on us. We've got the portal to Alfine which we need to use for various crafts, such as the elven mana spreaders which are faster than the living wood ones. These spreaders can handle 15 energizer at once, so they save a ton of space. Elven Bruin is actually really cool. We can add in an elf glass, glistering melon, potato and nether wart, and it brews into a flask of mending with six uses. This is an instant health 2 potion that we can use six times. So let's make ourselves the Terra Blade. This costs a full mana pool of mana just to make the ingots required. It does a disappointing amount of damage, but it is unenchanted and I'm curious about the laser it shoots. Okay, so it has a ranged melee attack as it dealt the same damage? We need a source of XP so we can get everything enchanted just to give it a real test. Looks like we have half a pool of mana so let's set up another Terra Steel ingot and we're back to grinding away at Batania. We are so close to getting all of the Terra Steel armor but we're in a pretty big pickle. To make the boots we need a Rune of Winter. That requires us to get a cake. And what does a cake require? Three buckets of milk. Why is that a problem? Well, all of the cows on this planet seem to be frozen solid. And if we milk them, we get powdered snow. That means that we need to level up Farmer Village at Oh, that was delightfully unexpected. Who would have thought that you first just need to wash the cows before milking them? So with that, we can craft up the Rune of Winter and make Terra Steel boots to complete our look. This actually looks fantastic. We just need to do some final preparations to defeat three Guardians of the Gaia. We're as ready as we ever will be. This finish array actually came in clutch because if we take out one of the finished smelts, we receive all of the XP that's been stored inside of the furnace. That meant that we could easily enchant everything. So there's one final mission standing between us and saving this world. It's terrifying and the odds are against us. But we have our extremely expensive Terra Steel armor, we have assorted flasks and we've got four incense sticks waiting to be lit. Anxiety is through the roof, so let's get this done. Oh no! The incense sticks are too far away. Let's chug some flask and let's go. Our first hit did hardly any damage. This can't be good. We're taking wither damage. Our health is literally being eaten away. Okay, it's time for some instant health. That was too close. That's it. We're on to phase two. We're about to be overwhelmed by hostiles. Shield to the rescue. We're actually dealing with these quite well. That's it. The final stage. We are victorious. The Guardian has fallen. Their spirits, now ours. Two more Guardians remain. Let's get this done. Our mission is complete. We can now continue with making the catalyst. We start with the Gaia agglomeration plate and we can craft up four Gaia spirit ingots. Then with a full mana pool, we can drop one Gaia ingot, one pixie dust and one dragon stone onto our Gaia plate. Then we cross our fingers and toes this wicks to get us one Gaia steel ingot. We just need to repeat this three more times. 
But first, let's quickly craft up the four time in the bottles we need. Then all that's left to do is fill this mana pool three more times and we can continue. We have the catalyst. All that's left to do is save the world from its eternal frost and make it habitable once again for future generations. 